y'all, it's Lynn. And Chrissy. And for today's program, we're going to be talking all about New Orleans and Mardi Gras. So for anyone who knows either one of us, and now for those of you who don't know us, New Orleans has played a huge part in both of our lives. And so of course, we want to share some of that Nala love with all of you. And what better time to do so than during Mardi Gras? Simply put, there's no place in the world quite like New Orleans. It is lively, energetic, diverse, spooky, super tasty, loud, colorful, spicy, musical, artistic, stinky. Seriously, y'all, there is a very real distinct New Orleans smell that I absolutely love, but I have no idea how to describe. Okay, yes, maybe it's stinky, but also it endures triumphs as a port city, historically, and as a place where colonialism first happened. It is a place that's literally steeped in history and a wide range of diverse cultures. It is a great melting pot of our country. Real talk, though. New Orleans is so much more than just a list of adjectives and images on the screen. So even though we can't take you there right now, and trust us, we really wish that we could, we are gonna try and break down some of the history, both good and bad, of this amazing city. We'll also show you how New Orleans, the city, and its locals have adapted over the years and why their ability to adapt is especially important this year. So let's get started. And And also a big ol' who dat. So let's talk about Mardi Gras. The celebration of Mardi Gras, also known as Shrove Tuesday, depending on where you are, dates back to medieval times in Europe. Feasting on the days leading up to Ash Wednesday, which begins the Lenten season of fasting, were common in Italy and France. And these traditions eventually made their way to the New World with the French and the House of the Bourbon, although some of the traditions date back thousands of years to pagan celebrations and Roman festivals of Saturnalia and Lupercalia. And just so that we all know, What does Mardi Gras actually mean? Mardi is for the French word for Tuesday, and gras means fat. So in France, the day before Ash Wednesday came to be known as Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. Now let's talk about how Mardi Gras became what it is today. So stick with me here because we are gonna go through these pretty fast. On March 2nd, 1699, French Canadian explorer Jean-Baptiste Bienville arrived at a plot of ground 60 miles directly south of New Orleans and named it Point de Mardi Gras. He named it this when his men realized it was the eve of the holiday. Bienville also established the area which is now known as Mobile, Alabama in 1702. In 1703, the tiny settlement celebrated America's very first Mardi Gras. In 1704, Mobile established a secret society similar to those that form our current Mardi Gras crews and it lasted until 1709. So wait a minute, what is a Mardi Gras crew? A crew is a social organization that puts on a parade or ball for the carnival season. The term is best known for its association with Mardi Gras celebrations in New Orleans, but it has also been used in other carnival celebrations. In 1710, the Booth Gras Society was formed and paraded from 1711 through 1861. The procession was held with a huge bullhead pushed along on wheels by 16 men and always occurred on Fat Tuesday. Kind of sounds like a parade float to me. So New Orleans was established in 1718 by Bienville. By 1730, Mardi Gras was celebrated openly in New Orleans, but not with the parades that we know today. In the early 1740s, the Louisiana governor established elegant society balls, which became the model for the New Orleans Mardi Gras balls of today. The parties continued on over for the next few decades until the Spanish took over New Orleans in 1760, and they worked to shut down what they viewed as depraved celebrations. The bans remained in force until Louisiana Louisiana became a U.S. territory in 1812 through the Louisiana Purchase. From then until 1837, the holiday was recognized, but definitely not encouraged. By the late 1830s, New Orleans held street processions of maskers with carriages and horseback riders to celebrate Mardi Gras, dazzling gaslight torches known as flambeaux and lit the way for the crew members. In 1856, six young Mobile natives formed the Mystique Crew of Comus invoking John Milton's hero Comos to represent their organization. Comos brought magic and mystery to New Orleans with dazzling floats known as tableau cars and masked balls. Crew members always remained anonymous. In 1870, Mardi Gras' second crew, the Twelfth Night Revelers, was formed. This is also the first recorded account of Mardi Gras throws. So what are throws? Well, they're exactly what they sound like. Items that crew members on floats throw to parade goers as the float pass by. Throws often include beads, cups, homemade trinkets, toys, and more. Most crews have medallion beads that feature that year's theme. Like Comus and the Twelfth Night Revelers, most Mardi Gras crews today develop from private social clubs with restrictive membership policies. 
Since all of these parade organizations are completely funded by their members, locals call it the greatest free show on earth. Two years after the revelers formed, Rex, the king of carnival, was created as a persona to oversee the Mardi Gras daytime parades. The social clubs that presided over the parades and balls are the ones primarily responsible for the Mardi Gras we know today. This group who created the persona of Rex did so to honor the visiting Russian Grand Duke Romanov. This group also introduced Romanov's family colors of purple, green, and gold as the carnival's official colors. Purple stands for justice, gold for power, and green for faith. So just fast forwarding a little bit, since Comus ushered in the modern era of Mardi Gras in 1857, the New Orleans festivities have been canceled about 14 times. Most of those cancellations came during the Civil War, World War I, World War II, although some revelers also stayed home during an 1870s yellow fever outbreak. The last time that it was called off completely until this year was 1945. A scaled down version even took place in 2006, just months after Hurricane Katrina flooded the Gulf Coast and killed over 1,800 people. So now we know about the creation of New Orleans and Mardi Gras as we know it today, Lynn's gonna tell you a little bit about how New Orleans has become extremely adaptable over the years. The origins of the New Orleans version of celebrating Mardi Gras cannot be separated from its historical moment. The later years of reconstruction in the American South and the decades immediately following it were a period of intense reaffirmation of the racist segregation of society at all levels and Mardi Gras crews, their balls, and their parades were no exception. It's no accident that the kings and queens of the wealthiest crews were also pretty decorations to support a white patriarchal and elitist social agenda. For more information about this topic, check our program notes for other resources. In response to and in spite of the racial segregation practices of early Mardi Gras celebrations by white New Orleanians, black communities develop their own traditions that celebrate the strength and endurance of their communities and ancestors, even in the face of enslavement and Jim Crow laws. The most famous of these black crews is the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club, which was founded in the early 1900s by a group of folks who were members of the same Benevolent Aid Society. Benevolent Aid Societies were community groups that funded the support of black families in times of medical need or for paying funeral costs or even what was an early form of health insurance because black New Orleanians couldn't access that assistance elsewhere due to racial prejudice. The Zulu Parade features African-style outfits, painted coconuts for throws, and blackface facial paint. According to Loyola University New Orleans professor Tremiko Melanson, this costume, even including the blackface, was always intended to, quote, mock white created caricatures of black identity, including blackface minstrelsy. Their costuming simultaneously embraced black identity, connecting them to the Zulu of continental Africa in ways that elevated darker skin tones and shades of blackness in a color conscious New Orleans, end quote. For more of Professor Melanson's analysis of the ways that race has always been a factor in Mardi Gras celebrations, see our link in our program notes. Other black celebrations and traditions of Mardi Gras include the 202-year-old group, the Skull and Bones Gang, which marches at dawn in the historically black neighborhood called the Treme, which is adjacent to the famous French Quarter and the stunningly gorgeous Mardi Gras Indian tribes who start their masking, which is what they call the dances and marches they perform, on Mardi Gras and end with a big celebration called Super Sunday, which is always the third Sunday in March. Their costumes take all year to make, and each masker makes their own costume by hand, including the, all of the thousands of tiny beads. When racial integration began across cities in the U.S. in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement and the passing of the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968, Mardi Gras crews began to integrate too. In fact, Zulu was the first crew to racially integrate in 1973. It was a slow process though and it required the passing of a city ordinance in 1992 to fully enforce social equity in Mardi Gras celebrations. By the way, that's not very long ago at all. The ordinance, quote, prohibited crews from discriminating on the basis of race, religion, sexual orientation, or national origin, end quote. And the famous and long-standing all-white crew of Rex pledged immediately to integrate. But Comus, Momus, and Proteus crews chose to stop parading altogether rather than open up their ranks to blacks. Comus has not yet returned to the streets. Momus spun off into the Knights of Chaos and Proteus came back in 2000 after signing the non-discrimination pledge. Mardi Gras has always been a way to create community while also making important statements about what's happening in the world. There hasn't always been room for everyone in a parading crew as, and as the years pass, folks are finding new ways to make sure that there's a place and a space for each of us to parade with pride and joy. There are all kinds of reasons beyond race and class to create crews and marching clubs. For instance, there's a walking parade that is one of the first to parade each year that was created specifically by a group of artists to be a kind of maker's parade. But there are also now crews with all genders present as well as all women's crews now. 
The Crew of Muses was founded in 2000 by professionally academic and artistic women who bring children's art to their throws and floats, as well as the Crew of Athena founded in 2014 that has the specific mission of bringing together professional women of diverse backgrounds. My favorites happen to be the Crew of Barkus, which is a walking parade of dogs and their owners that travels through the French Quarter each year, and the intergalactic Crew of Chewbacca's. That's a science fiction themed crew with about 150 sub crews, including my especially beloved Les Durettes, which honors Princess Leia Organa of Alderaan. If you know, you know. After Katrina in August 2005, the city and its residents were really struggling to rebuild, and many of the people in New Orleans wondered if Mardi Gras should even happen in 2006. But whether it was out of spite or honoriness or just finding joy where you can, Mardi Gras came back, albeit in a smaller way, on February 28, 2006. Last year, COVID-19 was just coming into focus for us here in the United States, and the parades and crowds from 2020's Mardi Gras are why New Orleans was an early hotspot for the pandemic. This year, parades are canceled out of an abundance of caution, but Mardi Gras itself can never be canceled. The food traditions, the decorating traditions, and the community building traditions are still present and happening, just a little differently this year. Maybe you only have your king cake with your immediate family or the folks in your bubble. Maybe you have a parade in your neighborhood that people just watch from their cars. Or maybe you decorate your house like a Mardi Gras float, which keeps the very talented artists who create those floats every year for parades working at their crafts and it lifts up community spirit at the same time. You might remember that Christy and I said something in French at the beginning of this. We said, laissez le bon temps rouler, which is essentially translated as let the good times roll. There is a spirit of joy and hope embedded in that, as well as one of letting your cares be set free that is important for us to think about when we are considering what maybe is missing this year from Mardi Gras celebrations. So we're finding our happiness and our joy here in Chattanooga when we think about Mardi Gras and our friends in New Orleans are finding their happiness and joy making new ways to celebrate Mardi Gras work for them in the strangest of years. And one day we'll all be there together catching those throws next Mardi Gras. Laissez le bon temps relais.